Most of this world lives in mournful rather than in joyful. And um, it's something that kind of irks me a little because I, I don't live that way. And sometimes I think it's like, well, then I've, I've done it myself. I figured out how not to live mournful. And I realize the thing that I have isn't something that I earned. I isn't something that I uh, discovered myself. It's something that has been gifted to me. And it's why so badly I want to share it with other people. So by the way, if we haven't met before, my name's Rick. Uh, maybe we should start there, right? Um, I'm the pastor here at Kingship, and I'm just so glad you're here. Um, there's, a, there's a question that Neil deGrasse Tyson, did I say his name right? Uh, what does it matter? Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, he, didn't, he didn't come up with this question. Other people have been asking this before, but it's, he obviously is the one that made it famous thanks to TikTok and social media and all the, all the sorts. But here's the question. He says, can God create a rock that is so big that he cannot lift it? Can God create a rock that's so big that he cannot lift it? If he can, then he's not all-powerful. If he can't, then he's not all-powerful, right? And then by Neil's linear line of thinking, his reasoning, right? Either way, which is really what he's trying to say and get to, right, is God's not all-powerful. And this question, I don't know if when you think about it, does it does it, you, you ponder it, you think about it, you're like, man, I'm, I want to engage with it, I'm intrigued, I want to maybe try to solve the problem. Um, but more, more time you think about it, it really is a straw man's argument. Because uh, terms aren't defined. And there's assumptions being made about God that are very limiting. Because the way that Neil's looking at the question actually doesn't take into account something that I know of and something that I think we should all be aware of, is that God is a holy God. God is perfectly holy, and he's perfectly good, and he can't betray either of those things. His power, his, he is all-powerful, but at the same time, he is also all-holy, and he is also all-good, that both of those things come from him. Let's set some terms. God is holy, which what I mean by that is, is that he is set apart. That, as the scripture says, there is no one else like him. There's no other thing like him, no other one like him. He's not common. He's not common like you and me, which is, which is amazing then when we have Jesus come and be with us, right? That he does become common. But God himself, God Almighty, we often view God as with our perspective. It's like we try to put the mind of man into the mind of God. And so we view his ability, his justice, his motives, his goodness, his love, his power, but we do it all with our own limitations. We view that only through ourselves, which is backwards because God did not come from us. We came from God. Or as scripture points out that God is not like man and then gives a really good example. God does not lie. We're pretty good at lying. Uh, very good at it. But God does not lie. He doesn't change. And what is so great is that what he says, he does. When he speaks, his will is done. All right, so Neil's question is actually working in the wrong direction. To compare God's power to the weight of a rock is to assume that both are formed of the same thing. Right? That creation is equivalent to creator. That they're bound by the same rules or bound by the same nature, the same, same laws. When in fact, one of them sets all of those things in motion for the other. The other big thing is that God's power is not aimless. He's not randomly trying to figure out whether or not he can lift rocks or not based on how big they go. God's power is used for his character and his will and has always done so. It, the way we look at the framework of God's power, we tend to look at it, or really we're trying to control God's power based on what we expect or what our experiences tell us of what is possible. But here's, here's the truth. God's power is not just above ours. God's power is beyond our impossibles. That what we view as absolute is not absolute for God. And that's really good news. I, I think about the women that day walking to the tomb. And again, it was a mournful day for them. They woke up mournful. They were sad. And they were going to take care of a body. And as they were walking, 
there, the, 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 on that Friday, the day, the, the day before, before, um, they, they saw the tomb get sealed. They knew that it was, they were there. They saw everything be closed up, Jesus' body in the grave. They saw that. And yet, as they're walking that day, it dawned on them, and they said, oh, wait, who's going to open the tomb for us? They came to prepare for preparing the body for, for burial, and they just it dawned on them. They're like, it's sealed. It's done. It's over. And yet, Scripture says that they kept walking to the tomb. They kept walking as if their feet was telling them to still have hope. That, that God will somehow make a way. It, there are many stones in our lives. Stones that have been placed up that we think are an unmovable. That are unmovable things, that they're, they're absolutes in our life. They're barriers that might keep us from God. Barriers that keep us from having peace. Barriers that keep us from having a life that we feel like is actually full. And it doesn't ever solve a void. And this particular stone, the stone that was placed over the tomb, that particular stone, it signified death. That when that stone, that rock was placed over there, that meant whoever's inside, that's the end. That's final. That death is certain, just like taxes, right? But if you wonder if their feet tell us to keep moving, to keep moving in a way that has hope, these are probably the questions that they're asking. Is it possible? Is it possible for God to defeat death? We know that Jesus had said, he had said that he was going to rise again in three days. That he, he was going to overcome death. That death would no longer have its sting. That he kept these promises. He assured this. He went to the cross willingly without defending himself. Is it possible for God? Is death truly an absolute? Is it a law that God has to abide to? Uh, something that he has to work around, right? Or is God the creator of life? Is, is life something that God sustains and holds for us? That everything we see around us is not just merely here by accident, but that a God created it? And if so, then what is death? Is death merely just the absence of life? And thus that means it's the absence of that creator, of that God? All right, so the real question for us is, for those that have fallen short, for those that experience brokenness in their life, who are on, and we're all on this path to complete separation from God, experiencing this separation from Him, is then resurrection possible? That's the real question to ask. See, there's a typical process to our line of thinking. And when you hear the resurrection story, this is usually what we're thinking about, is this. God has done something supernatural, in a natural world. You ever heard this before? God has done something that, whoa, is divine, that's, that's crazy, we've never seen before. He sacrificed himself, he overcame death, he defeated it and rose again and then ascended into heaven. These are all supernatural things. Or does it actually go much deeper than that? I think it does. God has done something actually, not supernatural, but natural of his character. It's natural of his nature to be a sacrificial God, to be a God who loves, to be a God who has grace, and to a God who is holy and above and beyond all things. In fact, in what he's done is not in a natural world, it's in an unnatural world, in a broken, not as it was created to be, world. You realize that? So we treat this like our baseline. We treat what we're dealing with in life right now, this, this brokenness, the evil that we see, the, the world that we're dealing with around us, the way we feel, the darkness that we experience, we feel our sinful nature as optimal. And that's our baseline. It's just expected, right? Rather than, hey, we're fallen. This isn't right. So our baseline actually needs to be, we need a savior. That's how we should be living this life. We need a savior because... Time and history has shown we can't do it on our own. You know, Israel spent, God's chosen people, they spent their lifetime trying to prove that they could do it on their own. God sets, sets the laws, here's what's right and holy. They said, that's great, we'll uphold it, we'll figure it out, and then they didn't. And they spent a lifetime realizing, oh man, we need a savior. 
We need a God who can actually do this because we can't do this on our own. He'll, and not only that, when he has to accomplish these things, um, he has to also overcome one important thing, which is this. He'll also have to transform our hearts. Because it's not just about overcoming death, it's also about overcoming our sin. Our sin does some, some amazing, weird things. The one first thing that it does is makes us ignorant of God, that we'd rather just say, hey, I'll do it on my own. The second thing is, is, is that it keeps us away from God, keeps us from a relationship with Him. But the other thing, it keeps us from actually living for Him, living in a way that is righteous and holy, just like He is in His image. All right? And there's this funny thing about us, is if he's, he's come to save us, then that part that he has to get over is what we call the rat race. It's our competitive side. You might not even believe in a God, but you still act like there is in someone that you have to compete against. It, you, we do this thing where we say, if God can, I can. If he can do it, I can do it. And so there's this stubbornness of us of like, I gotta prove myself. To who? I, I don't know, but I gotta prove myself. I gotta own my own merit. I gotta, I gotta live up and make myself bigger than anything else. And so when we talk about resurrection, I thought this was actually kind of interesting. I thought maybe we should actually look at what science today actually believes about resurrection because the conversation we could have had 10 years ago isn't exactly the same conversation we'd have today. So I did, so I did some research. Do you wanna know what I found out? You know, very interesting, yeah, right? Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> That's what I found out. Resurrection, we're close. That's what they're saying. We're close. We're almost there. These are all theories, right? I understand, but we're close. They're saying that hey, we're actually tinkering with it now. They're actually doing something with biological resurrection. And they're saying in our children's lifetime, okay, in our children's lifetime, we will be able to live forever. Just think about how many body parts you have to replace for that to, to happen, right? But we're going we're gonna to live forever and that we're going to be able to resurrect. And it's all possible and it's our near future. I think that's also very interesting because that doesn't actually, like, I get it, but how did Jesus do it without all our technology, right? Yeah? I mean, but this is what's interesting, is we're going to go away from having a conversation about whether or not resurrection is possible. We're all going to agree about it. The real question now is whether or not Jesus did it. And then it gets to my favorite question, which is this, why? Why did Jesus do it? Why did Jesus resurrect and at the same time, while we're getting closer, we're living longer than ever. Does everyone realize that? We're, we're living longer than ever now. And at the same time, like eternity is being offered to us, a man-made eternity. And at the same time, depression is on the rise. Anxiety, all-time high. Suicide, through the roof. Quality of life, interest in life. Not, not much there. I think it's so interesting that we're basically saying that man-made eternity a lifelong of forever is being offered to us where we don't ever have to experience death and we're responding with uninterested. That I'm uninterested in that. And I think it's because we see the broken world, the sinfulness of this world, we see the darkness, the evil of this world, and we go, that's an absolute, it cannot be defeated. We think death then in the end is just the inevitable. It's what we all need. It's just the inevitable that, that, that just has to be there and that God can't do anything about it. And that's not true. You know, Jesus didn't just come to overcome death. He didn't just do it like, like, you know, like a parlor trick. Like, hey, I defeated death. Go on about your lives. Don't worry about that thing. Keep on going. The reason he did it is so that he could offer us new life. A new life that's not plagued by death that's not plagued by the consequences of death, which I think goes to a deeper issue because you are probably living in your life thinking that there's this thing, there's this action that you've done, or there's something in your life that is absolute, that God cannot touch, that God cannot fix, that God's grace and his forgiveness for you cannot reach whatever this barrier is. But that's exactly why Jesus came to the cross. That's exactly why his atonement is made possible for us. That Jesus' sacrifice covers over us and removes not just death, but the consequences of death. That his resurrection then is about rescuing us from the separation from God. But I gotta tell you, 
what's holding us back then? It's just our stubbornness. Our stubbornness to have to rely on God or have to rely on another person or another being is just the only thing keeping us from actually having new life. Because we'll sit and tell ourselves, nah, I'm doing it on my own. <laughs> I don't need anybody. You'll see. Right? It's, our, it's like our own little God attitude inside of ourselves that try to do whatever we can as long as we think it's possible. If God can, I can. Right? If you're claiming God can do it, I can do it. What's the difference between us? Instead of realizing that instead of by our own means, it's through Christ. And through Christ is the only way to this new life. But we'll sit there and we'll try to pick ourselves up. But I think it'll still end up leaving a void. So let's say, let's say for a second, all right, I can do it. I can live perfectly, never make mistakes. Um, I start neutral, right? That's the baseline. I'm not good. I'm not bad. You watch me. I'm going to do it all. In the end, it would still leave a void. It would still leave this emptiness and this darkness in you, even if you were the greatest person in all the world. If you trumped Jesus, you were better than Jesus, there'd still be this void because it lacks this essential thing that's still missing, which is knowing Christ. Can you imagine getting to know your God? And not just know him, not know about him, but know him personally and experiencing what it truly means to be known. Because I think that's a big emptiness in, inside of all of us is that we just want to be known. That's why sometimes we lash out. That's sometimes why we deal with things that we, we shouldn't be dealing with. It's why we, we have relationships with each other is because we want to be known. And yet we know, even within relationships between ourselves, I'm not truly known. And maybe I'm not even truly known by myself, but there's a God who truly and fully knows you. Paul, Paul from the Bible, he would argue this. He would say, like, look, I, I'm the one that probably did it right more than anybody else. A little arrogant guy, I think. But he's making a point. He calls it confidence in the flesh. And he would say, look, I have every reason to tell you I was able to pick myself up. I was able to do it and prove myself all on my own. He had the right family. He had the right bloodline. He had the right prestige, the right status, right? He had a life that he could find peace on his own without God. I'm sure he could. He could also count himself as, not bl or count himself as blameless, right? Because he, he did every law perfectly. No one did it better than Paul, he'd say, right? But he also had wealth. He has good living. He was in good standing with Rome. No one was bothering him. It was a cushy life. And yet, Paul says, all of that? is worthless, absolutely worthless in comparison to knowing Christ and knowing Jesus, not just knowing him, but knowing him as Lord. Let me read this passage for you. It, it's in your bulletin if you want to look at it. Um, I'm going to read just a section from it. I'm going to start in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Can you imagine? Can you imagine throwing everything away, and yet it's still worth it because of Christ? And be found in him, not having righteousness on my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The power of the resurrection is about being known. It's about coming to know Jesus and having a personal union with him. That's what's happening. See, on the cross, when, we, we say, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, it means go to your death with me, that we'll be infused together, that I am with you. That is what he's offering us, is with you, so that your old self can be put to pass, that can be crucified, so that you can have new life, that you're no longer enslaved to sin, but that you get to know me, says Jesus. You get to know me, and you get to live with me, and you can live in my way that is good and holy, 
that does not have darkness, that you can have joy. And here's the best part. You do not have to wait for eternity. You can have it right now. And that's the best part about what Jesus is offering us. You can find your identity, the the identity of you wanting to be truly known, you can find it all in Jesus. You know, this is the crazy part that I always think about is that how would you get to know an eternal God? How would, you, how would that even come to be? Like, can you imagine that? Getting to, like, know an eternal God and that He fully knows you? You know the only way for that to be possible is that if you experience eternity with Him. That's the only way that that's possible, to, to have that kind of knowing each other, that kind of union with each other, that kind of relationship, that deep relationship with each other. The resurrection is about knowing our living and our powerful God. Amen? I don't know where you are in the story. I don't even know your story, but I know that God knows your story. And I don't know specifically the thing that's keeping you, like that hump that you just can't get over. But I, I want to identify it for you. It's stubbornness. It's rebellion. It's ignorance, but in the end, it really boils down to you just going, no, I'll do it myself. Can I just assure you of one thing? If Jesus indeed has resurrected and he says that he is holding all of us, that he is interceding for us, for us to God so that we may be known If you just simply rest in that and put your faith in that, if you put your faith in Him and His actions, I guarantee you, you will start to experience eternity, not just in the future, not just through our death, our physical death, but that we will go through a spiritual death now and experience His Spirit with us, and we can start living eternity today. That we can move from being mournful to hopeful, and then live joyfully. Isn't that good? So if that's, if that's what you need right now, I, here's what I, I'm not trying to persuade you. That's not my job. <laughs> my job is to tell you the truth and tell you God's word. And he says, just trust in me. So if you, if you are ready to do that, come see me. I'll pray with you. Um, I, I so badly just want you to know Jesus as, as I know Jesus. Jesus.